us. To Ann Curry. Because now we have a camera. Ah. Katie Mattinell, thank you so much this morning. Good morning, everybody, again. It is 8 a.m. in Salisbury, North Carolina, 7 a.m. in Chicago, 5 a.m. in Calaveras County, California, where the news is being made on this Tuesday, September 11th. It is such a pretty morning, it isn't is it? It's a perfect fall morning here. Yeah. Although it's not fall yet, so <laughs> it's still a perfect summer morning. Miles and miles of sunshine. Miles Davis. We're going to put miles out there today. Nice as it can be across the Northeast. Uh, rough seas still uh, from, uh, uh, from the chop from that hurricane. But other than that, it's kind of quiet around the country. We like quiet. It's quiet. It's too quiet. One of the most well-known structures no longer with us today is the Twin Towers. Their story, their legacy, and their demise is something many already know all too well. Or perhaps hardly at all. Join me today as we review the origins of these legendary buildings, what made them so iconic, and the complex events that led to their demise. My name is Lee Brees, and this is Modern Ruins, Episode 6. Originally, the site of the World Trade Center was a part of the Hudson River, with the shoreline located approximately where Greenwich Street is today. In the year 1613, Dutch explorer Adrian Block and his crew were forced to abandon their ship, the Tiger, when it burned to the waterline and the stranded men then began the first European settlement in the area. The rest of the wreck sunk to the riverbed and was buried when expansion of the Manhattan shoreline began in 1797 and wouldn't be discovered until 1916. Almost a century later, Another 18th century ship was discovered in 2010 during excavation at the former World Trade Center site, 20 feet from the surface, and was believed to have been a Hudson River sloop. In the 1900s, the World Trade Center site was a part of New York City's Radio Row, a warehouse district mainly consisting of electronics manufacturing and repair firms, to which the main product of the time was radios. The center of the district was at the intersection of Cortland and Greenwich Streets, and flowed out from there. More than 50 different radio shops occupied this relatively tight area. The era of Radio Row is largely credited to have been from 1921 to construction of the World Trade Center beginning in 1966, with World War II and the affiliated parts shortages being one of the more notable times for the district. The idea that became the World Trade Center came about in 1943 when the New York State Legislature passed a bill that gave New York Governor Thomas Dewey full authority to develop plans for a project that would further stimulate economic development in certain parts of Manhattan. No immediate action was taken, and the plans were officially put on hold in 1949. David Rockefeller, the grandson of oil magnate John D. Rockefeller, was a notable business person in New York and was working with Chase Bank at the time after stints with the Department of Defense. He had spent his first year after college working as an unpaid secretary to New York Mayor Fiorello LaGuardia, and according to the mayor, he essentially was filling the role of deputy mayor during his time there. Years later, when the idea for economic development came up, Rockefeller suggested placing a World Trade Center in the less developed Lower Manhattan to ignite economic activity in the area and for New York City as a whole. This would be the first of its kind in the world. Essentially, a World Trade Center is a place authorized by the World Trade Centers Association to promote and expand trade by providing services or assisting firms in conducting trade, mainly internationally. Or just a really fancy name for government-owned office building. The New York and New Jersey Port Authority, now charged with the project, narrowed the site down to two choices, a location near the since-demolished Hudson Terminal or near the South Street Seaport, with the latter site along the East River featured in the initial plans that were made public. As a combined state agency of New York and New Jersey, 
the Port Authority would have to get approval from both states. New Jersey Governor Robert Miner objected completely to New York receiving the entire $335 million project in 1961 dollars. Negotiations stalled between the two states as a result throughout the governor's lame duck period. In December 1961, the Port Authority began to meet with New Jersey Governor-elect Richard Hughes. The negotiations proved to be more fruitful as the Port Authority agreed to move the proposed World Trade Center project from the East River location to the site located next to the Hudson Terminal, which was easier for people from New Jersey to get back and forth from. In return, the Port Authority would take over the declining Hudson and Manhattan Railroad, which suffered an 80% decrease in ridership over the previous 30 years, renaming it to the Port Authority Trans-Hudson. The Port Authority of New York and New Jersey began immediately acquiring land in Radio Row through eminent domain, giving each business a flat fee of $3,000 in 1965 dollars, regardless of assets. The district was home to mostly commercial and industrial sites, and opposition to the project was more than fierce. A court case brought on by several Radio Row businesses challenging the Port Authority's power of eminent domain made its way up the court system, but the fight ended when the Supreme Court refused to hear the case. Land procurement was completed in 1965, and the demolition of Radio Row to make room for the World Trade Center began in March 1966, and was complete by year's end. On September 20th, 1962, the Port Authority announced that Minoru Yamasaki would be the lead architect for the project, with Emery Roth and Sons acting as the associate architects. The largest constraint on the design was the amount of office space needed. Yamasaki suggested the idea of twin towers at the complex to meet the office space demand, suggesting that each tower be 80 stories tall. But in order to meet the 10 million square feet needed, the towers had to be raised to 110 floors. Yamasaki's final design for the Twin Towers was released to the public on January 18, 1964. Each tower would be an exact square measuring 208 feet in each direction, totaling almost an acre per floor. However ironic, Yamasaki chose to showcase his fear of heights by using narrow 18-inch office windows, which according to Yamasaki would also help people in the building feel secure. His design was inspired by the architectural ethic of Swiss architect Le Corbusier, Gothic modernism, and Arabic architecture, as he had just completed his design for the Dharan International Airport in Saudi Arabia. Another significant aspect of the Twin Towers design was its elevators. Yamasaki and his team chose to use the relatively new Sky Lobby system that would utilize express elevators which would take you to certain sections of the building, and then local elevators would take you to your floor from there. This was opposed to the traditional elevator system, where each elevator went to all floors and required significantly more of them. The Sky Lobby system allowed for 75% of the available floor space to be utilized. Compared to 62% using the traditional system, in total, 95 elevators would be needed for both towers. The design did receive criticism from the American Institute of Architects and others. Lewis Mumford, philosopher of technology and friend of Frank Lloyd Wright, wrote a significant criticism of the design in his book The Myth of the Machine. More succinctly, Mumford said that the towers were just glass and metal filing cabinets and looked like the boxes the Empire State Building and Chrysler Building came in. After the project was finished, many complained about Yamasaki's use of 18-inch windows, which provided little visibility and natural light given their depth. After the design was complete, the project then went to Magnus and Clemensic Associates, who served as the structural engineering firm, with the Port Authority's engineering department serving as the foundational engineers. The firm came up with a framed tube structural system which removed columns in the core of the building and transferred lateral loads to the perimeter of the structure. As a result, the perimeter columns were placed very close together, which also contributed to the narrow 18-inch windows. While core columns still assisted with gravity loads, 
the building was much more dependent on its perimeter structure for stability. This is why, coupled with many factors, the buildings ultimately collapsed when its perimeter was penetrated. The frame tube system became very popular and almost all buildings over 40 stories tall are constructed in this manner. With most post 9-11 built buildings featuring a robust concrete core to decrease the structural reliance on the building's perimeter, but also allowing for more open floor plans and usable space. While the Empire State Building, among others, used concrete around steel elements as fire retardant, which also dramatically increased the weight and therefore resistance to sway, the structural engineers of the Twin Towers used spray-on fire retardant, which coupled with the decreased structural members in the core of the buildings, made the towers comparably lighter and much more susceptible to sway. Engineers added viscoelastic dampers to absorb the sways to a tolerable level, which engineers did real-life tests to determine. After final approval from the necessary parties, the groundbreaking for the World Trade Center project would take place on August 5, 1966, with most of the construction not beginning until 1968. Construction started on one World Trade Center first, with construction on two World Trade Center beginning four months later. Tishman Realty and Construction Company would serve as the general contractor for the project. Given the site's location on a filled-in portion of the Hudson River, a bathtub had to be built around the site to keep groundwater out, and crews had to dig down to bedrock for the tower's foundation, which was 65 feet from the surface. Once construction went vertical, the Port Authority spent over $74 million in 1965 dollars on steel alone for the buildings. Construction heavily relied on prefabricated pieces off-site. The topping out ceremony, when the last beam is placed, for One World Trade Center occurred on December 23, 1970. Two World Trade Center began accepting tenants in January 1972. The final ribbon cutting for the Twin Towers, the world's tallest buildings at the time, occurred on April 4, 1973. The total cost for the structures topped out at over $900 million in 1970 dollars. At the grand opening, One World Trade Center was the tallest building in the world, standing at 1,368 feet of usable space, surpassing the Empire State Building's 40-year run. Two World Trade Center came in second when completed at 1,362 feet. The towers, coupled with the Sears Tower in Chicago, also had the most floors of any building in the world and would hold that mark until construction of the Burj Khalifa in 2010. A year after the grand opening, French daredevil Philippe Petit crossed a high wire set between the North and South Towers, which was unauthorized by the Port Authority. It took Petit 45 minutes to cross the 200-foot span, more than 1,300 feet above the ground. Petit was charged with criminal trespass and disorderly conduct, but was freed in exchange for performing for kids in Central Park. In 1975, Owen Quinn base-jumped from the roof of the North Tower and safely landed on the plaza between the buildings. In 1983, high-rise firefighting and rescue advocate Dan Goodwin successfully climbed the outside of the North Tower to call attention to the inability to rescue people potentially trapped in the upper floors of the skyscrapers. Among other interesting events, the 1995 PCA Chess Championship was played on the 107th floor of the South Tower. Other than the aforementioned complaints of the design, one of the other concerns that quickly became apparent was the lack of restaurant and cafeteria space built into the complex for employees to use, and most of the time, you would have to leave the building to eat out for lunch. There were skeptics and critics of the completion of the Twin Towers, in the final deal with the city, the Port Authority would make direct payments to the city instead of paying taxes for private tenants that would occupy leases within the buildings on a subsidized basis. Coupled with the existing vacancies in the private buildings, New York City real estate tycoons were appalled about the project and that the subsidized leases would dry up all the available tenants. The public was left out for input on the design, and reaction to the complex was mainly negative as the project was monolithic and overambitious. Over the next decade or more, several smaller buildings were also constructed at the Superblock, which took the entire area between West Street, Church Street, Liberty, and VC Streets. 
Five and six World Trade Centers were built alongside the Twin Towers, with six World Trade Center housing the U.S. Customs Service. Four World Trade Center opened in 1975 and housed the U.S. Commodities Exchange. The final two structures would be completed in the 1980s. Three World Trade Center opened as a 22-story hotel in 1981, and the 47-story Seven World Trade Center opened in 1987. The 16-acre site also featured an underground shopping mall and train and subway stations, and also housed one of the world's largest gold depository vaults. Between all of the buildings was the 5-acre Austin Tobin Plaza, named in 1982 after the Port Authority's chairman at the time of construction. The plaza could hold up to 6,000 spectators for summer concerts, but due to the Venturi effect created by the buildings and the large statue in the middle of the plaza, the location wasn't the most ideal concert venue and went under a $12 million renovation in 1999. Two World Trade Center had an indoor observation deck called the Top of the World on the 107th floor that had widened windows topping 28 inches that allowed views over Manhattan and the Hudson River at a height of 1,310 feet. The Port Authority renovated the space and leased it to Ogden Entertainment in 1995. Several attractions were added to the observation deck, including a movie theater that would showcase a helicopter tour around the city. There was also a subway-themed food court that housed Esbaro and Nathan's famous hot dogs. Visitors could also travel up via escalators to an outdoor observation deck at a height of 1,377 feet. On a clear day, visibility was estimated to be 50 miles. With the design of the deck, the view was unobstructed, which made it more popular when compared to the observation deck of the Empire State Building, which had an obstructed view. In One World Trade Center, instead of an observation deck, the space housed the Windows on the World restaurant on the 106th and 107th floors. Restauranteur Joe Baum opened it in 1976 at a cost of $17 million. The restaurant featured two offshoots in addition to the main course. One was a Danish smorgasbord and sushi cafe, and the other was Cellar in the Sky, a wine bar and wine school. The offshoots would change names after the 1993 World Trade Center bombing and the subsequent renovations to the greatest bar on earth and Wild Blue. In 2000, the restaurant reported $37 million in revenue, making Windows on the World the highest grossing restaurant in the U.S. Despite the restaurant's great success, the 1990s would end up being the final decade for the towers. And unfortunately, the decade became a series of tragic events. The 1993 World Trade Center bombing on February 26th had been the most significant event to that point at the towers. Ramzi Youssef, a Pakistani terrorist, parked a rented rider truck in an underground parking garage of the North Tower which had 1,500 pounds of explosives in it. At 12.17 p.m., the explosives were detonated, which opened a five-story hole causing significant structural damage. Six people were killed, and 1,042 were injured, mainly due to smoke inhalation. Five individuals total were convicted for involvement in the bombing, with Yusuf and one other convicted for carrying it out. It was later determined that the conspirators' plan was to destabilize both towers and bring them crashing down, which was unsuccessful. Several important systems for the towers were destroyed, however, including the refrigerant system for the building's air conditioning. The underground gold depository was also damaged. After the bombing, security was heavily increased at the complex, including mandatory security for access to the South Tower's observation deck. A reflecting pool was erected to honor the victims who died from the attack. Despite the fanfare the New York government and Port Authority had for the complex, the private sector excitement never had equalized. The Twin Towers would suffer high vacancy rates for most of their life and didn't achieve full occupancy until 2000. In the late 1990s, the Port Authority sought to lease the complex to a private firm to add the whole site to city tax rolls and provide funds for other Port Authority projects. After several years of sorting through bids, it was announced on February 15, 2001, that Vornado Realty Trust won the lease on the entire World Trade Center, fully privatizing it, 
for $3.25 billion for a 99-year lease. However, Fornado then insisted on last-second changes to the agreement, including shortening the lease term, which was non-negotiable for the Port Authority, and so the slightly lower $3.22 billion bid from Silverstein Properties won in the end. The deal was closed on July 24, 2001. And it can't be communicated how significant this agreement would go on to become after the upcoming events. Little did Silverstein Properties, or anyone else for that matter, know that less than six weeks later, the mediocre yet iconic Twin Towers would become one of the most well-known places on Earth and change the course of American history. If you weren't alive during the latter half of the 20th century, it's hard to explain the amalgamation of factors that contributed to fierce tensions between certain parts of the Middle East and the United States. Throughout that time, the U.S. had been involved in several conflicts in the region and continued to maintain a large military presence after those conflicts were over. The U.S.'s imperialistic actions weren't always welcomed. Some of the examples of the U.S.'s constant presence in the Middle East includes their leadership in the formation of the State of Israel, the coup d'etat installing the U.S.-friendly dictator the Shah in 1979, their cozy relationship and military base installation in Saudi Arabia, and large military presence after the Gulf War. To fundamentalists and radical Islamics that arose from these events, any U.S. support of regimes in the Middle East was seen as aggression against Muslims. In 1979, a 22-year-old man by the name of Osama bin Laden left King Abdulaziz University after spending several years studying economics and business administration and growing his understanding and passion for the Sunni Islamic religion. He left the university to aid Abdullah Azam, whom he had met at the university, in the fight between insurgent groups and the Soviet Union and the Afghanistan government. Bin Laden, the son of a billionaire construction magnate from Saudi Arabia, brought money and machinery to aid the fighting. The U.S. aided insurgent groups by providing weapons and other resources. The U.S. supported the groups because of their efforts to keep out communist influences of the Soviet Union in the region. The insurgent groups they supported would end up being the precursor to the terrorist group known as Al-Qaeda. The U.S. support, however, did not change Bin Laden's opinion of U.S. intervention in the Middle East. More than two decades later, Bin Laden was exiled from his birth country for ongoing vocal opposition to the presence of the United States in Saudi Arabia. Bin Laden thought the U.S. was turning the Middle East into American colonies and that the U.S. was going to destroy the Islamic holy sites of Medina and Mecca. Bin Laden's family then disowned him and cut off his $7 million annual stipend. Bin Laden then moved around a bit as other countries debated exiling him due to his radical beliefs and then went back to Afghanistan. It was at this point that U.S. intelligence agencies began placing surveillance mechanisms tracking Bin Laden and what he was working on, photographing and recording video of his various activities. Bin Laden then invested in various businesses to earn cash and began building various construction projects in Afghanistan and briefly had a job with a British firm hunting surveys. The group Al-Qaeda was quickly growing during this time, with bin Laden having constructed several training camps for the group to train militants. The group conducted several terrorist attacks throughout the many Muslim countries, but it wasn't until the 1990 FBI raid of a suspected Al-Qaeda affiliate's home in New Jersey that U.S. intelligence learned of plans the group had to carry out terrorist attacks in the U.S., Throughout the 1990s, the group carried out attacks in the Middle East, Europe, and Africa. In 1996, Osama bin Laden declared war on the United States, citing the continuing presence of the U.S. military in the Middle East after the Gulf War. It was after this declaration that it is believed the planning for the September 11th attacks began. Khalid Sheikh Mohammed is believed to have conceived the idea for the plot, Bin Laden then gave approval for Mohammed to go ahead and begin planning the attacks. Planning meetings continued from 1998 into 1999 involving the two men and Bin Laden's deputy, Mohammed Atef, 
who provided operational and logistical guidance. Atef wanted to also attack the U.S. bank tower in Los Angeles, but bin Laden dismissed his idea for simply lack of time. Bin Laden provided the financial resources for the plot and selected the participants. The original men selected and sent to the U.S. to take flying lessons in San Diego spoke little English and performed poorly in their lessons. Bin Laden then sent new Al-Qaeda recruits from Hamburg, Germany, who all spoke English well, and one of them already had a commercial pilot's license. Over the course of the year 2000, the men arrived in the U.S. and took flying lessons at Huffman Aviation in South Florida, with the prior selected men now in assistance to the new crew. The men all used either passports from corrupt Saudi officials or used fraudulent passports to gain entry into the U.S. Ben al Sheib applied many times for a visa to the U.S., but was rejected because as a Yemeni, it was feared that he may overstay his visa, and instead helped with the attacks from Germany. Bin Laden and the group selected September 11th as the date of the attacks because that was when John Sobieski, the King of Poland, and Grand Duke of Lithuania, began the battle which turned back the Ottoman Empire's Muslim armies that were attempting to capture Vienna on September 11th, 1683. Bin Laden saw this as the first instance of Western dominance over Islam. By 2001, the CIA had an entire unit dedicated to tracking and following Bin Laden's activities, called Alex Station. The NSA had intercepted calls the men made to schedule meetings and feared something malicious was going on, but took no action. Saudi intelligence warned the U.S. about the presence of Al-Qaeda members in the country, and the CIA went as far as to break into Midhar's hotel room in Dubai and discovered he had a U.S. visa. Alex Station notified intelligence agencies around the globe about this fact, but not the FBI. By late June 2001, the CIA knew that at least two Al-Qaeda members were in the U.S. and was absolutely certain that some sort of significant attack was about to take place but originally thought it would be in Saudi Arabia or Israel. Specifically, Richard Clark and George Tennant of the CIA were especially concerned, and Clark put all domestic agencies on full alert and advised that the Defense Department go to threat condition Delta. Separate from the CIA's intelligence, the FBI had found through investigations that suspicious activity had been going on at civil aviation universities and that there was substantial evidence that Osama bin Laden had planned a coordinated effort to send students to aviation schools across the U.S. Kenneth Williams, an FBI agent based out of Phoenix, sent this message to FBI headquarters, Alex Station, and an FBI office in New York with this information, and said that all flight school managers need to be interviewed and identify all students of Arab descent seeking flight training. Despite both the CIA and FBI intelligence, the walls of bureaucracy that separated intelligence and criminal investigations, coupled with the secrecy of the methods of the CIA and NSA, are ultimately what prevented the crucial information alluding to the 9-11 attacks from being brought together. On August 6, 2001, President Bush received a presidential daily briefing, which was entitled, Bin Laden Determined to Strike in U.S., and showcased some of the patterns of suspicious activity, but did not stand out among other reports of potential hijackings or attacks, and it's unclear whether any further action was enabled from there. And the upcoming attacks would have little to no opposition from U.S. intelligence or armed forces before being carried out just one month later. On the morning of September 11, 2001, Polls opened for the New York City municipal elections, and U.S. President George Bush was in Longboat Key, Florida, where he was promoting his education agenda. And that morning, he went for a jog around the Colony Resort where he had spent the night, which was only 30 minutes after the soon-to-be hijackers got on their first flights before reaching their intended connections. Just before 8 that morning, all the hijackers had checked in for their targeted flights at their assigned airport on the East Coast, and the various crews called each other from the terminals to confirm that the plans were set. 
at 7:59 a.m., American Airlines Flight 11 took off 14 minutes late from Gate B32 at Logan International Airport in Boston for Los Angeles, with 81 passengers, 11 crew members, and five hijackers on board the Boeing 767 aircraft. At 8:14 a.m., United Airlines Flight 175 also took off 14 minutes late from gate C-19 at Logan International Airport, also heading to Los Angeles, with 56 passengers, 9 crew members, and 5 hijackers on board the Boeing 767 aircraft. At the same time, Flight 11 was hijacked over central Massachusetts and began turning northwest, then south. At 8.20 a.m., American Airlines Flight 77 took off 10 minutes late from Dulles International Airport in Fairfax County, Virginia, once again set for Los Angeles, with 58 passengers, 6 crew members, and 5 hijackers on board the Boeing 757 aircraft. Around this time, Flight 11, now flown by Mohammed Atta, begins to send transmissions out with Atta saying, Nobody move. Everything will be okay. If you try to make any moves, you'll endanger yourself and the airplane. Just stay quiet. Betty Ong, a flight attendant on board, then calls American Airlines Flight Reservation Center in Cary, North Carolina, describing the horrific scene on the plane during the hijacking. Given the suspicious radio transmissions and the flight attendant call, two F-15 fighter jets are sent from Otis National Guard Base on Long Island to intercept Flight 11. The final plane involved in the attacks departed at 8.42 a.m. United Airlines Flight 93 took off 42 minutes late from gate A-17 at Newark International Airport for San Francisco with 37 passengers, 7 crew members, and 4 hijackers on board the Boeing 757 aircraft. At the same time, Flight 175 is hijacked above northwest New Jersey, 60 miles from New York City, and continued southwest before turning northeast. Horror would strike only a few moments later, as hijacked Flight 11 reaches its intended target, crashing into One World Trade Center between floors 93 and 99, with all elevator shafts and staircases cut off by the impact. As the events of the day quickly came to unfold, It wouldn't be much longer until the motion of the whole world would come to a complete stop. At 8.50 a.m., Flight 77 above Southern Ohio is hijacked and turns towards the southeast. Then, only 15 minutes after the first plane crashed into the North Tower, Flight 175 crashed into the southern-facing side of the South Tower between floors 77 and 85 with parts of the plane exiting all sides of the building and falling to the ground as far as six blocks away. As the Northeast was becoming a war zone, President Bush was at Booker Elementary School in Sarasota, Florida, and just before he is about to read the pet goat to elementary school students, Chief of Staff Andrew Card whispers into Bush's ear, A second plane hit the second tower. America is under attack. Bush then proceeded to read the book to the students before entering the adjacent classroom to a command center set up by the Secret Service to further evaluate the situation. He stated later that he opted to continue the lesson instead of alarming students. At 9.28, the final plane, Flight 93, is hijacked over northern Ohio and turns towards the northeast in the direction of Washington, D.C., and the White House is evacuated. Just a few moments later, Flight 77 crashes into the west side of the Pentagon, starting a violent fire. After the crash, the FAA issues an order to shut down all U.S. airspace and all aircraft are ordered to immediately land at the nearest airport. Shortly before 10 a.m., passengers and crew begin to revolt against the hijackers on Flight 93 to take back the plane after hearing about the other hijackings. And six minutes after revolting, the plane was intentionally crashed by the hijackers in Somerset County, Pennsylvania. 
it would be later determined that the flight's destination was either the U.S. Capitol building or the White House. The world then watched as the South Tower of the World Trade Center collapsed, only an hour after impact. President Bush then departed Sarasota, Florida aboard Air Force One, with the intended destination still undecided. Thirty minutes later, the North Tower of the World Trade Center collapsed, in addition to three World Trade Center. By the end of the morning, all air traffic in North America was shut down, and at 5.20 p.m., World Trade Center 7 collapsed, leaving four, five, and six World Trade Centers standing, but severely damaged. At this point, the motion of America and the world had come to a complete stop. Americans now surrounded television sets wherever they were, hugged the people around them, and were overcome with emotion and shock at the unprecedented event they had just witnessed. With the worst over with, fleets of fire trucks, ambulances, and police cars had arrived on scene at the now former World Trade Center site to rescue people from the rubble, with volunteers ready to begin digging. Only 20 people would be found alive among the scattered remains of the Twin Towers. 14 people who had managed to get to an emergency stairwell survived the collapse of the North Tower, and the 12 firefighters and two civilians were able to climb the stairs to the top of the rubble field. When all tallied up, 2,996 people died from the attacks, including all the passengers and crew of the aircrafts, people trapped in the towers and the Pentagon, over 400 first responders, and the 19 hijackers involved in the attacks, with only 1,600 of the bodies being identified. The 19 hijackers are left out of most of the death totals and were excluded from receiving death certificates. More than 25,000 people would be reported injured. While this was devastating, media estimates suggested that as many as 50,000 people could have been trapped in the towers by the plane crashes. Official estimates more accurately determined that 17,400 people were inside the buildings at the time of impact. That night, at 8.30 p.m., President Bush addressed the nation and the world, saying, Terrorist attacks can shake the foundations of our biggest buildings, but they cannot touch the foundation of America. These acts shatter steel, but they cannot dent the steel of American resolve. It was almost apparently obvious by nearly every person in America that the attacks were put together by Osama bin Laden. Bin Laden publicly denounced responsibility for the attack until 2004, despite evidence on the contrary, and had been a wanted man by the United States since the 1998 U.S. Embassy bombings in Africa. It would be almost 10 years before special forces would track down bin Laden in Pakistan, ending his life on the spot. The remaining World Trade Centers that were left standing were completely demolished soon after the attacks, and the Deutsche Bank building across the street was condemned because of the toxic conditions inside, and the building was later deconstructed. In total, it took eight months to clean up the entire World Trade Center site. A 2006 study estimated that the Twin Towers had appeared in 472 films and television shows, many of which pulled episodes or removed scenes featuring the towers, and all songs that talked about the World Trade Center were pulled from the radio. The events would dramatically change the way America and the world traveled and lived their everyday lives, and also impacted the way skyscrapers are engineered. The Twin Towers were already very well-known pieces of architecture and iconic structures before the 9-11 attacks. Given the events that took place at the site, it seems inappropriate to make any comment about what the area, New York City, and the world would be like today if they were still standing. The World Trade Center 
originally a beacon of trade and commerce, ended up a dark reminder of just how fragile freedom is. While 9-11 was overwhelmingly unfortunate and sad, I think the world was made better by the changes that came out of it. No one should have to die to learn the lessons that we did that day and after, but their sacrifice wasn't in vain. Every year, we commemorate the events as something that brings us together, which is so rare today. And if we're old enough, we'll think about where we were when the towers collapsed. We'll live with the events for the rest of our lives and the rest of our history, and hopefully that memory will always remind us how blessed we are for our freedom and just how easily it's taken away. And on that note, thank you for watching. Subscribe to Labrice TV for more Modern Ruins content. And be sure to comment what Modern Ruin you'd like us to cover next.